Good afternoon, everyone. Meteorologist Steve Caparata here from the WAFP First Alert Storm Center. Thanks to all of you for joining me once again. We're going to talk a lot about hurricanes. Give everybody just uh, another minute or so to tune in. And maybe a little bit of uh, housekeeping here. Getting lots of questions about how to view these presentations outside of watching them live on here. So once we're done with this, it'll take just a little while, uh, but we'll clip it out. We will post it to our website. I'll share that link afterwards. Some of you may have already seen the link from the other day, the presentation I did the other day. Uh, that one has been posted on our website now for a couple of days along with the worksheets. Uh, I've also produced a few more worksheets today that will go along with uh, today's presentation. We'll be adding those to that web page. Uh, but on top of that, um, unfortunately, normally we might be able to stream this live straight through our Roku, our Fire uh, TV apps, uh, our WAP apps app on uh, Roku and Fire TV, but we're so busy with all the coronavirus news, our digital team is, that we can't tie up that channel to do it live. However, uh, they are posting it, uh, the recording on Roku and on the Fire, uh, Fire TV apps after the fact. If you want an easier to way to watch it on your TV or a big screen, uh, they are posted. So when you get into those apps on the Roku, on the Fire Stick, scroll down a little bit and you'll see a section that says education education uh, they'll be posted there. Uh, some of you may have figured out um, you can mirror sometimes from your phone or your tablet onto a TV. So if you have a, a Chromecast, uh, sometimes you can do that with the Roku's and the Fire TVs, I believe also. Somebody commented, I didn't even know this, I learned something uh, today myself. Uh, I think they might have mentioned uh, that they were using a Fire TV or Fry Fire TV stick, that there's a Facebook Live app. Uh, so it's another way that you can maybe get this on a TV on a bigger screen if you want to do that. All right, uh, we're a couple of minutes past 1, 103 now, so let's go ahead and get this started. Uh, so we're going to talk all about hurricanes. Some of you have already checked in. I'm going to peek over my other screen here time to time. Some of you have already checked in. Kind of let me know where you're watching from. I'd love to hear that again today. And by the way, uh, thank you so much to all the parents out there that shared pictures from the other day session of your kids watching and participating. Uh, that was just great to see. Really made my day and my evening to go through those and see those and uh, see that uh, we've got kids uh, participating in that. Uh, so now that we got the housekeeping out of the way, uh, let, let's get into this now. And, and uh, I'm going to keep myself up now today. We're going to try to keep myself up here on the bottom and uh, as we work our way through this. So let's go over some real basic stuff to start out first today. This has uh, always been one of my favorite little facts when I talk about hurricanes, but our word hurricane comes from the, uh, the word hurricane. Uh, this is from the Mayan people, really smart people that were around hundreds of years ago. And that word hurricane uh, was their name for their god of wind, fire, and storm. So basically what we call a hurricane today they knew they were bad, and they gave it that name way back when. Uh, our hurricane season, I'm assuming just about everybody here is watching from the United States today, mostly South Louisiana. So the hurricane season that we're mostly interested in for the Atlantic and into the Gulf of Mexico officially runs from June 1st through November 30th. So for the kids that are watching this, why do we have a hurricane season? Well, the reason for that is primarily because... Those months, June, July, August, September, October, and at least into part of November, those are when the ocean, when the water is warm enough to support a hurricane. Uh, that's the main thing that hurricanes like is warm water. So that's why we have a hurricane season. Now, having said that, uh, nature doesn't follow a calendar. We can still get tropical storms and hurricanes outside of those months from time to time. But that's when most of them come, and we'll look at that in a little more detail in a moment. Now, where we live, north of the equator, we'll talk more about that also, depending on how old you are, kids, you may have learned about we're in the northern hemisphere, north of the equator, our hurricanes spin counterclockwise. So I've put it down here at the uh, bottom right of the graphic. Um, but what counterclockwise means is uh, the opposite of the way that the hands usually move on a clock. And that's the way our hurricanes spin uh, when we track them here in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, before I get deeper into uh, the basics, I just want to give you a look at one of my favorite hurricane images. Uh, this was Hurricane Florence uh, a few years back. 
This was an astronaut on the Interna International Space Station out in space looking down, basically looking out the window of the International Space Station and took this image from up above. Pretty cool, isn't it? Pretty amazing what you can see from up above. Very few people get that opportunity, but I'm going to show you we do have weather satellites that go out into space and those also basically take pictures of the clouds from up above. All right, let's get into how a hurricane forms. And a couple of things I'm going to talk about here for those of that uh, were with me the other day. Some of this is going to sound a little bit uh, familiar. So we start out over the ocean. The sun heats up the ocean and we get uh, liquid water starting to change into water vapor. That's called evaporation for the kids that were with me the other day. So liquid water changes into a gas. That air starts rising up into the sky with the water vapor in it and eventually as it gets high enough into the sky it starts to cool off again and changes back from a gas into liquid water drops and makes clouds. We call that condensation. Now up there at cloud level it's important that the air already is kind of moist. It can't be real dry. If it's real dry up above us then the hurricane's just not going to form. It's not going to happen. So the next thing we look at, wind shear. What do I mean by wind shear? Well, when we look at the winds, we not only look at what's happening down here on the ground or on the surface of the ocean, but we need to know what winds are doing up above where the clouds are. And if the winds are moving too fast up at cloud level, or if they're moving in different directions as you get higher and higher, we call that wind shear. And what happens is, as a cloud and a thunderstorm tries to grow, the seedling, the beginning of a hurricane, as it tries to grow, if there's too much wind shear, it gets knocked over. And that just keeps the hurricane from developing. So we need wind shear to be low. Uh, next thing we look for is warm water. Now the graphic here says ocean temperatures must be around 80 or above. Must is probably a strong word, but we generally speaking want to see the water somewhere close to 80 degrees, if not above, in order for a tropical system to develop. That is the fuel, the gasoline that hurricanes feed off of. So once we get a cluster of clouds and rain starting to develop and they start to spin a little bit, if the winds are 38 miles per hour or less, that's when we call it a tropical depression. That's the early stages of what could eventually become a hurricane. As those clouds continue to spin, maybe grow a little bit bigger in size, and the winds get stronger when the winds get anywhere between 39 and 73 miles per hour, then it becomes a tropical storm. Once it's a tropical storm, that's when it gets a name. We're going to talk about names in a moment. And then if the winds get to 74 miles per hour or higher and the system continues to get better organized, that's when we call it a hurricane. That's officially when it becomes a hurricane at that point. All right, the next thing I want to go over with you guys, we're going to divide a hurricane up into four parts. We're going to call that a quadrant. So a lot of the kids may not have heard that word before, a quadrant. Basically, that's one-fourth of the hurricane. If we brought, divide up into four pieces, one-fourth. And we're going to talk about which part of the hurricane is typically the worst. So we start with the center of the, the storm, the center of the hurricane, which I bet some of you already know this, but the center is called the eye. Talking about, let me show you where I'm pointing here, guys. Right in here. That's the eye of the hurricane. So as we look at this quadrant, which we call the right front. So if the storm is moving this way, it's right of center and it's in front of the center. So we call that the right front quadrant. That's usually the worst of a hurricane if you happen to fall in this particular area when a hurricane is moving ashore, hitting land. Now, as we look at the left front quadrant. So this part is left of the eye and out in front of it, the left front quadrant. We still get a lot of wind, we still get storm surge, but it's not quite as bad typically as what is the uh, right front quadrant. Next we go to the right rear. So this one is right of the eye and on the back side, the rear of the eye, that's the right rear quadrant. 
still a lot of wind down here and still some pretty significant impacts again just not quite as bad as the right front and then as we look at the left rear left of the eye and behind it this is the weakest part of a hurricane but that doesn't mean it's not dangerous it's still dangerous so most importantly when we look at a hurricane moving towards land it's the right front quadrant that is the usually the strongest and the most dangerous let's talk a little more about ocean temperatures and the water and the importance of that this is a graphic showing the sea surface temperatures for today what do i mean by sea surface temperatures well that's actually measuring the temperature of the ocean but just the top layer of the ocean remember guys the ocean's really deep but we're only talking about the the top layer we're looking at what the temperature is so if we look out in the and depend on your age again i know some of the young kids may not know this some of the older kids will this is the gulf of mexico that i'm circling so the gulf of mexico is right here here's louisiana and baton rouge so down here in the gulf of mexico we've got a lot of green showing up today so that means the water temperatures are largely still below 80 degrees not warm enough yet to really support a hurricane that's not a surprise because we're in march but i do want to show you a couple of things number one look over here by miami and off the coast of florida you see that stripe of yellow that's an ocean current called the gulf stream uh, some of the older kids may have heard of this before so that's a current of not only warmer water but it's somewhat deeper warm water that moves up the coast off the coast of florida right off the coast of south and north carolina and eventually out into the atlantic but there's a second current that gets a lot less attention, but pretty important for those of us that live along the Gulf Coast, around the Gulf of Mexico. And it shows up pretty well on this graphic today. It's this little stripe of yellow and orange. This is called the loop current. So this is another current that has not only some warm water, but it's deeper warm water. And I'm going to show you why that's important in a minute but basically we get water that moves along the south coast of cuba this is cuba moves along the south coast of cuba moves through this little pass here into the gulf of mexico and then it usually kind of spins back around down through the florida keys and then kind of merges with the gulf stream all right so i wanted to show you why that loop current is so important now this graphic's got a lot on it, but I'm going to explain it to you. So we're looking back at Hurricane Katrina. This was in 2005. One of the worst hurricanes on record to ever hit the United States. Bear with me just one second here. Let me close something out. So Katrina was a really bad hurricane that came into Louisiana in 2005. If you can make out the little thin black line, that's the track that it took. Now what's all this red stuff? Well, it's labeled on here. This is the loop current. But again, the loop current, it's not only warm water at the top of the ocean. That warm water goes hundreds of feet down into the ocean. So when Hurricane Katrina tracked over, you see how the black line goes right over the loop current? That gave it lots of fuel. And that's when Hurricane Katrina got its strongest because here's what happened guys uh, when a hurricane moves over the ocean sometimes the water right at the top of the ocean is pretty warm but there might be some colder water down below and because a hurricane has so much wind it stirs up the water sometimes it pulls up some colder water from below and that actually eventually weakens the hurricane but if it's moving over something like the loop current where that warm water is really deep then it basically has an endless supply of the fuel that it needs to keep going and that's one of the reasons katrina got so strong as it moved across that part of the gulf of mexico as it got closer to louisiana there was less of that fuel and katrina actually did weaken a bit before it hit unfortunately it was too late it was still a really bad storm but it wasn't as strong by the time it hit louisiana and mississippi so we have a way of ranking hurricanes and how strong they are. It's called the Saffir-Simpson scale. 
Where does that name come from? Well, that's the two people that came up with it. Their last names were Saffer and Simpson. The scale ranks hurricanes from one to five. It's based solely, completely on the wind speed of the hurricane. So a category one hurricane is the weakest. So those are winds of 74 to 95 miles per hour. The category five is the strongest. That's when the winds reach 157 miles per hour or stronger. That's really intense, really strong. Now, when we look at the scale, anything that is a category three, a four, or a five is what we call a major hurricane. These are the ones that are the most destructive, do the most damage. But that's the scale that we use to rank hurricanes. Here's another look at that Saffir Simpson scale and the different impacts. So we have a house that's right along the coast. If you have a Category 1, assuming the house is built fairly strong, it's going to weather that Category 1 okay. It might get some minor damage, but it should be okay. The trees will have some damage, but the house itself shouldn't be too, too bad. As we get into a Category 2, again, if the house is built well, it'll do okay. Now, it varies a lot. All houses are built differently. Category 2, you can start to see some damage to the house, especially a lot of times the roof. That's a weak spot. But even Category 2s, the main part of the house is going to hold up okay as long as we don't have a tree falling on the house. Those of you, especially the parents that are watching, that are around for Hurricane Gustav and in this part of the world, Baton Rouge and South Louisiana, certainly remember that. That was one of the issues. Gustav was a Category 2, and we had a lot of wind and a lot of down trees, a lot of trees that fell, so that did damage homes a lot. Now, as we get into a Category 3, that's where the damage really ramps up. So this graphic is showing, you saw how the roof changed colors. That's a lot of the shingles, the roof starting to break apart. So we get into a Category 4, that's when you can really start to see uh, significant damage to a house. And sometimes if you get a Category 5, we've seen this, uh, for instance, Hurricane Andrew in 1992 that hit South Florida before it came into Louisiana, but it was Category 5 when it hit South Florida. You had spots where the entire home was wiped off its foundation. So those are the worst of them. That's a look at what our different category of hurricanes can do. All right, let's talk a little bit about names and uh, how we do it and a couple of little... Uh, a little bit of points of trivia about tropical storm and hurricane names. So, I need to back up a little bit here for the kids. Uh, if you look up at the top of my graphic, I have 2020. These are the names for this year. Atlantic Tropical Cyclone names. What's a tropical cyclone? Well, a tropical cyclone is not just a hurricane. That includes systems that are tropical the way they're organized, but uh, not, it doesn't necessarily have to be as strong as a hurricane. So I mentioned earlier, we, all, we start to name systems once they become a tropical storm. Winds of 39 miles per hour are stronger. So that's why we have tropical cyclone up here. So for the kids, take a minute, look at this list of names. Arthur, Bertha, Cristobal, and it goes on down. All right? I'm going to point out a couple of things, and I want you to think about, maybe you can tell mom, dad, whoever you might be watching with, if you notice any patterns to the names, okay? Give you a second to look at it. So number one, these are in alphabetical order, or ABC order. So every year, every hurricane season, our names are in alphabetical order. It starts over. So the first name is always going to start with an A, the second one with a B, and so on, down through the alphabet. But if you're looking closely, there's something missing here, right? I've got 21 names on my list. How many letters are in the alphabet, kids? Say it out loud for mom or dad, whoever you're sitting with. 26, right? So I have 21 names on the list, but there are 26 letters in the alphabet. There are five letters that we don't use with tropical storms and hurricane names. Those are Q, U, X, Y, and Z. 
Why is that? Well, the group that comes up with these names, they're a group called the World Meteorological Organization, or the WMO. Uh, you don't need to remember that, but the group that comes up with this, these names decided a long time ago they didn't have enough to choose from that started with Q, U, X, Y, and Z, so they left them off, and that's why. Now, here's the second thing I want you to notice about the names. Do you notice another pattern? Arthur, a boy name, right? Bertha, a girl name. Now, Cristobal, maybe some of you might know, might know, might not, but that's a boy name. So they're organized to go in boy-girl, boy-girl order, or male-female. In some years, it alternates. The next year, the first name will be a female name. It'll go female-male, female-male, but they always alternate like that. All right, last thing I want to tell you about names before we move on. So there are 21 names on our list. What happens? if we go through all 21 names in a hurricane season. It's only happened one time. This was in 2005, the same year as Hurricane Katrina and a number of other bad hurricanes. But we had way more than 21 storms. And what happens is we move on to what is called the Greek alphabet kids. So that's names like Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and so on. And you can look up the entire Greek alphabet if you want, but I just threw up the first seven letters of the Greek alphabet. So if we ever go through all our names, that happens. Now, I think I forgot to mention one other thing. Our list of names, they get rotated and reused every six years. So the names that are used this year in 2020, they will get used again in 2026. The exception is... If a hurricane's really bad, if it does a lot of damage, or if a lot of people unfortunately die in a hurricane, which happens, that name will get retired. That means we never use it again. And so they'll replace it with something else. If that happens, we come up with a new name to take its place. Um, a couple examples of names that have been retired. Katrina has been retired. Hurricane Andrew was a really bad storm in Florida and Louisiana. That's been retired, and you can Google that. There's a long list of names that's been retired. All right, now this is going to look a little confusing for the younger kids, but I'm going to tell you what we're looking at. This is showing us the number of tropical storms and hurricanes that form uh, in different months of the year. So... Uh, hurricane season officially begins in June, but we start this plot in May, and you can see that we sometimes actually get systems outside of what we call hurricane season. We can have them in May. But the first part of hurricane season, June into, into July, we get some storms, but not a lot. But uh-oh, look at this. You see how it kind of starts to look like a mountain as we get into August? So as we get into August and September, that's when we really start to get most of our tropical storms and hurricanes. September in particular is our busiest month, and even into about the first half of October, things stay pretty busy. And then the second half of October into November, usually things start to settle down pretty quickly. Now I have another way of looking at that. This is focused on Louisiana. It's a few years old. We need to update this. This is uh, some work Jay Grimes has done and I kind of up, uh, I've, uh, plotted some of his numbers here. But uh, for the kids that are watching, at least from Louisiana, the takeaway that I want you to notice on this graphic is we've had tropical storm and hurricane impacts in every month between May and November, but the vast majority of ours come in August and especially September. Two out of three of our tropical storm and hurricane impacts, our tropical storm hurricane hits here in Louisiana come in August and September. Those are our busiest months by far. All right, what about where do they form in different times of the year? So in June, the early part of the hurricane season, we often see them developing in the Gulf of Mexico. That's what that's showing. That's a common spot to see them. We can also see them in the month of June developing 
in the Western and Northwestern Caribbean. That's another spot they like to develop because in June, those are the areas that are often warmest. A third spot is over around the Bahamas. So this is typically where we have a lot of the warm water early in the season. As we get into July, what you'll see is once again, the Gulf of Mexico, yep, they like to develop there. Although July typically is really not that busy. Once again, the western, the northwestern Caribbean, that's another spot. Once again, the Bahamas, that general area also in play. But in July, we start to look a little farther out in the Atlantic. We can sometimes get them a little farther out in the Atlantic starting in July. By the time we get to August, uh, you'll really start to see things expanding where these develop. So the Gulf of Mexico is in play. That's a recurring theme here, kids, is throughout the hurricane season, the Gulf of Mexico is, generally speaking, almost always warm enough. Now, remember, it's not only the water temperature that a hurricane needs to develop. The atmosphere, what's happening in the sky up above us, has to be working for a hurricane to develop, too. The Western Caribbean in August is in play. Below this, a bigger area now from the Bahamas all the way into the western and central Atlantic as we get into August comes into play. And then as we get into September, I'm going to talk about a feature here in September and not just where they develop. September, um, something that's important, and this isn't just September, this is really August, September, even into October, an important feature is something called the Bermuda High. So for the kids that were with me the other day, we talked about high pressure and low pressure. Well, high pressure, when we have high pressure, the winds around it move clockwise like this. And so if you've got an area of high pressure out over the ocean like this, that's important for steering hurricanes. They're going to move around this area that we call the Bermuda High. Why do we call it the Bermuda High? Well, this is a feature that is... Uh, we call it semi-permanent. It's almost always out here in the Atlantic in some form. A lot of times it's centered kind of closer to Bermuda, which is where I'm pointing. It fluctuates, but it was given the name Bermuda High because it kind of is generally out here in the Atlantic in some form or fashion. So we get storms a lot of times that start out here around Africa. And if the Bermuda High is uh, kind of smaller and weaker, They'll rotate around the high, and then they'll turn over the open Atlantic, which is good news for the United States. That means, generally speaking, they're not going to make it all the way from Africa across the ocean and then into the United States. Now, if the uh, Bermuda High extends a little farther west and gets a little bit stronger, then those systems that start out around Africa contract farther west and may eventually threaten the east coast of the United States. And then if we get a even stronger Bermuda High that's built farther west than southwest, it doesn't happen all that often, often, but it certainly does happen. But we can get systems that start out here by Africa, move all the way across the ocean, eventually into the Gulf of Mexico, and then they're going to make landfall at some point. So the Bermuda High is one of those features that's real important in steering these systems as we get into hurricane season. I want to talk about something else that you guys are going to see as we get into hurricane season. Those of you that have followed hurricanes have seen this before. We call it the cone of uncertainty. This is sometimes called the forecast cone, where we think a hurricane, its best chances of uh, where it's going to track. Here's how the cone is made. The forecasters at the National Hurricane Center, they draw a forecast. They start out with five points, usually. All right, so on this graphic, we've got one here, 12 hours out in time, 36 hours out in time, 72 hours out in time, 96 hours out in time, and 120 hours. 120 hours is five days out. So they start by drawing points of where they think the storm might be. But then there are circles that are drawn around each point. Those are based on the average forecast error at that point in time. So here's the key takeaway. The forecast cone in a given hurricane season, 
from storm to so storm to storm, the size is not going to change because that is based off of forecast error over the last several years. It's not based off of how certain or uncertain the forecast is for that particular storm. That's a complicated uh, concept, I know. So not all the kids may get that, maybe a little more for the adults. But I want you to know the cone of uncertainty, the size, stays fixed in a given hurricane season. So once we draw the circles, they then draw a line that connects the outside of the circles on either side, and that's how you end up in the cone. Now, even with the cone, there's a couple important points to know. Number one, you see how we've drawn in a hurricane here? Guess what? The clouds, the rain, the storms, those extend outside of the cone. So the impacts extend outside of the cone. Number two, uh, one out of three times at some point in time, the storm is going to track outside of that forecast cone. That's our margin of error. That's what happens on average. So while the forecast cone is meant to represent our best estimate of where the storm may go, don't take it as a literal exact location of where it's going to end up. All right, I'm going to talk quickly about storm surge. So what's storm surge, guys? So storm surge is hurricanes. They have a lot of wind with them, right? So as a hurricane's coming to shore, all that wind pushes water onto the land. And that big surge of water that comes ashore com comes on the land. We call it storm surge. So that's what this graphic is showing here. You see with three feet of storm surge, six feet, and then with 12. If you get 12 feet, most homes are going to be uh, mostly underwater. So those homes that are closer to the coast, that's usually where it's the biggest problem. So storm surge is wind-driven water pushed ashore by a hurricane. All right, now I'm going to teach you guys how to track a hurricane on a map. Now in 2020, we all have apps for doing this. But when I was growing up, when your moms, your dads, your grandparents, whoever you may be with today, a lot of them when they were growing up, we used to have paper maps for tra tracking hurricanes. And I'm going to show you how to do it because, number one, I still think it's kind of fun to do it this way. And number two, I think it helps you learn a little bit about how the storm is moving. Number three, it helps you learn about geography. And number four, it helps you learn about what we call latitude and longitude. Now I'm going to explain it for you hopefully in pretty simple terms. So when we look at a map, and let me break this down for the younger kids. Here's the United States where I'm pointing. Louisiana is right about there. So as we look at a map like this, we can draw on lines that extend east and west. Those lines are called latitude. Now there's a really important line of latitude. The one that I highlighted here in red, that's the equator. We say the equator is located at zero degrees latitude. Okay, We're going to talk a little bit about these degrees and what that means. So the equator is a line of latitude that's at zero degrees. If we go north of the equator, we are in the northern hemisphere, and then each of these lines increases by 10. So that line is 10 degrees north, 20 degrees north, 30 degrees north. Now for those watching from South Louisiana, 30 degrees north does pass right through South Louisiana. If we go south of the equator, that's the southern hemisphere. And so we have 10 degrees south, 20 degrees south, 30 degrees south. These lines tell us how far a point is north or south of the equator. Okay, lines of latitude. Now, let's talk about lines that are north and south. These are called lines of longitude. Our most important line of longitude is what we call the prime meridian. Now, that one is our zero degree line. That one passes through Africa up into the United Kingdom, parts of Europe up into the United Kingdom. Now as we go west of the prime meridian, this is the western hemisphere. 
we get 10 degrees west, 20 degrees west, 30 degrees west, and so on. I could keep going. Here in southeast Louisiana, one of the big lines of longitude that comes through is 90 degrees west. And as we go east of the prime meridian, then we have 10 degrees east, 20 degrees east, 30 degrees east, and so on. So our lines that run north and south, these are called lines of longitude. Where the equator and the prime meridian intersect, we can give those coordinates. Coordinates are how we can specify where a point is on a map. So the coordinates for where the equator and the prime meridian, where they intersect, which would be right here, zero degrees north, zero degrees west. Why am I showing you that? Because I'm going to show you how to track a, a pretend hurricane here in a second. So where uh, our hurricanes occur, again, assuming everybody's watching here in the United States and uh, in the Western Hemisphere, our hurricanes are all north of the equator and west of the prime meridian. So that means when we try to figure out our coordinates, they're going to end with our latitude is going to be some sort of some number of degrees north and our longitude is going to be some uh, number of degrees west. Let me give you an example. So as we bring this in closer, I made up a hurricane. We called it Hurricane Titan. We said at this point in time, Hurricane Titan is located at 20 degrees north, 70 degrees west. So here's how you find that on a map, guys. So if we look at our hurricane tracking map, and I'm going to try to get one posted here, hopefully this afternoon, uh, one that you can print out at home. If, if, if you want one sooner, though, for the parents that want to print one, just Google it. You can find one. Uh, so what I'm going to do first is find 20 degrees north on my map. So here we go. I've highlighted it for you. Here's our 20 degrees north. Next, we want to find where is 70 degrees west. Here's 70 degrees west. And so where those two lines intersect, where they meet, that's our coordinates. 20 degrees north, 70 degrees west. And that's where our hurricane currently is. So that's a little, hopefully that helps kids. Hope That's a little tutorial on how to track hurricanes. Um, now, if you guys print a map this afternoon, it's probably going to have a little more detail than what I've drawn in here. So I drew in lines of latitude every 10 degrees and lines of longitude every 10 degrees. You may find some that show it every 5 degrees and you may even find some that show every degree. And the more detail actually the map has, the more that will actually help you figure out what you're trying to plot. But hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. All right, I just wanted to wrap up quickly here. I've got, I think, three slides, and then I'm done. I want to show you three different satellite images. So one of our main ways of tracking uh, hurricanes is satellites. Those of you that were with me the other day uh, heard me talk about satellites. Satellites, we launch them out into space, out on a rocket, and they go into orbit around the Earth out in space. The ones we use most often in weather are about 22,000 miles up above, called geostationary satellites. And there's a few different types of satellite imagery, satellite pictures that we use. So this first one, the first example I'm showing you, this is Hurricane Katrina. This is a visible satellite picture. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a satellite that relies on reflected sunlight to see the clouds. So what we're looking at here, this is the closest thing to a real life picture as if you just had a big camera out in space taking a picture from up above. That's what a visible satellite image essentially is. So we can, sorry, that's the wrong thing. Uh, we can see this hurricane because sunlight is reflecting off the tops of the clouds. That's a visible satellite image. Now, the limitation of visible, visible satellite imagery is once it's nighttime and we don't have sunlight anymore, we can't use a visible satellite. It's not going to show us anything once it goes dark. But aha, we have an answer to that. 
we can use something like this. This is Hurricane Andrew as it was moving towards Louisiana in 1992. This one is called an infrared satellite. Boy, it's a big word, right kids? Well, what is infrared? Well, our infrared satellites, instead of using reflected sunlight, they actually can basically take the temperature of the clouds. One thing we know is the taller a cloud gets, the higher it gets into the atmosphere, the higher it gets into the sky, the colder it gets. And the colder cloud tops, which are usually on a satellite image like this, now we can kind of make the colors whatever we want, but most often they're going to be something like this, orange or red. Those are going to be the coldest ones. Those are going to be the ones that are highest in the sky, and these are going to show us where the biggest storms are. Now one thing I didn't mention yet that you can kind of see on this picture, right around, here's the eye, right around, right surrounding the eye is what we call the eye wall. That's a uh, narrow band of really intense storms that surrounds the eye and this is usually where the worst of the weather is. So if we look at an infrared satellite, since it's essentially taking the temperature of the clouds, we can access infrared satellite pictures 24 hours a day. So that's a good thing. Our visible satellite pictures, they're really pretty and they're cool, but we can't use them at night. This type of satellite, we can use it all day, all night, whenever we need it. One last type I wanted to show you. This was Hurricane Irma, uh, was it two or three years ago, I lose track of the years. This is a water vapor satellite. And this one is actually a satellite out in space detecting the water vapor that's in the atmosphere. Uh, for the older kids, the water, va water vapor satellites give us a better look at what's happening in the mid and upper part of the atmosphere. Um, so a lot of times we like to look at this. This can give us a good look at the features in the atmosphere that are helping to steer a hurricane. Uh, but as we look at this particular image, Again, we can kind of make the colors whatever we want, but the dark greens are showing where the most water vapor is. So you can roughly say that's where the heaviest rain is. Um, there's the eye of the hurricane where you see the yellows. That's drier air on the outside of the hurricane. So that's another type of satellite image that we can use. That one uh, is also available 24 hours a day. We don't need sunlight for it, so we can use it whenever. All right, guys, uh, that was, I know that was a lot. Hopefully you're not worn out, uh, but that is everything I had put together, so here I am. All right, um, I'm going to slide back and forth a little bit, so bear with me. I've got another window open over here. Um, I'll try to answer some of your questions. Uh, apologies, I'm not, I can't get to every question to the kids. I'm going to do the best to try and answer some of them, okay? There's a lot of you in here, so I want to answer as many as I can. So let me, uh, let me take a peek. How many hurricanes have I seen in my life comes in from Alexis, age 12? Ah, oh, boy, I don't know if you mean in person or ones I've tracked. It's a lot. Uh, a couple of memorable hurricanes for me. Uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, certainly the, the one I showed you the uh, satellite image of. Um, in fact, I can pull that uh, can pull that back up. Give me a second here. Um, Hurricane Katrina here. Uh, that one, number one, I was working it here at WAFB in Baton Rouge. Number two, it hit New Orleans really hard, which is where I grew up. And then number three, I actually kind of worked as a reporter after the fact and went down there and covered it. Uh, the year before Katrina, 2004, I went and covered a hurricane that hit uh, came ashore in Alabama, Hurricane Ivan. Uh, started out in Gulf Shores and then had to move a little farther inland as it was coming ashore, but went through the eye of that one. Went through the eye of Hurricane Rita that came ashore in southwest Louisiana in 2005. Uh, covered that one from around Lake Charles. There's a bunch. Gustav here in 2008, Baton Rouge. I, I could go on and on, but it's been a lot. Um, okay, the strongest hurricane to land in the U.S. Uh, so, I 
think it still stands as what's called the Labor Day Hurricane of 1935. So why we call it the Labor Day Hurricane? Well, we didn't really start giving hurricanes, tropical storms and hurricanes names until the 1950s. So this one in 1935, it hit South Florida on Labor Day as in Category 5. So uh, I think that still stands as the strongest. Uh, Hurricane Camille, which kind of clipped extreme southeast Louisiana and then went into Mississippi as Category 5, ranks up there. That was 1969. Uh, Katrina, even though it was a Category 3 when it came ashore, in terms of what we call the barometric pressure, uh, so the pressure is high pressure and low pressure. Hurricanes are low pressure. Uh, Katrina had a really low pressure when it came ashore. Uh, good question um, from Camden. What happens if we go through the whole Greek alphabet? I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully that never happens. That's a lot of names, so that'll probably never happen. But that's a good question. Good question here from, well, this comes in from Yvonne. I don't know if that's uh, a parent or, or a kid here, but um, and I meant to cover this and I forgot, so I'm glad you asked. What's the difference between a hurricane and a typhoon? Nothing. The only real difference is well, what part of the globe those are happening on. So different parts of the world use different names for these tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So in the Atlantic, and here uh, around the Gulf of Mexico, we call them hurricanes. But in the Western Pacific, it's the same thing. It's the same atmospheric phenomenon, but it's called the typhoon. Uh, they call them on the uh, Indian Ocean and down around Australia, they call them just cyclones. So different parts of the world call them different names but they all develop the same way they're all the same thing we just call them different names in different parts of the world so i'm glad you asked that question uh somebody asking nicole here what will be my next topic still working on that one uh stay tuned i've got some ideas i'm hoping uh one thing i can tell you uh tentatively as it stands right now we're going to keep these going on wednesdays and fridays at this time uh at least hopefully through the end of the school year, assuming um, that we're uh, continuing with kids uh, at home through the end of the year. Now, I don't know if it, right now we're still officially April 13th, I think it is. Um, so I'm not saying I have any inside information. But if this, if this uh, school closure continues through the end of the school year, we'll try to keep it going through at least the end of the school year, uh, at least twice a week, Wednesdays and Fridays around this time. One idea I have for next week is maybe a little more hands-on for both you and me. I'm thinking about maybe doing some uh, simple weather experiments you could do with the kids. So I'll try to get uh, hopefully that one together. Maybe a little more fun <laughs> than just a lecture. So we'll try to get that together. Another thing I would like to do that may appeal to some older kids too is uh, I've got a number of friends that work in weather outside of TV. I've got friends at the National Weather Service. We've got friends at the National Hurricane Center. I've got friends that work at private weather companies and I'd like to maybe bring them on and just maybe do a little bit of an interview uh, talking with them and let kids ask their questions about uh, different jobs in meteorology. Uh, a lot of times kids think about meteorologists as only as on TV because we're the only meteorologists they often get to interact with, but there are lots of jobs in meteorology outside of television. Is it possible for hurricanes in winter? Uh, it's not completely impossible that you could get something out over the ocean, but in our part of the world, uh, around the Gulf of Mexico, it's not going to happen just because the water would be too cool. That was from uh, Leah. Let's see what else we've got over here. Okay, good question. Layla Oob wants to know if a minor hurricane can damage the coast. Absolutely. Uh, so one thing, one message we try to re relay 
is even though we have the scale, the Saffir Simpson scale, if you do the quizzes, the worksheets that I put together, that's going to come up. So remember Saffir Simpson scale. Um, but as we talk about the Saffir Simpson scale, we have to, talk, to emphasize this to parents too. Don't focus on the category. Uh, even the category ones, even tropical storms can produce a lot of damage. A really good example not too long ago here in South Louisiana was Hurricane Isaac, which was really a borderline tropical storm, minimal category one hurricane, uh, but it was a big storm and it was moving very slowly. And since it was big in size, even though the winds weren't as strong as we sometimes get in our hurricanes, it was just big and it was moving slowly. We had record storm surge in some spots. Uh, people that live around Laplace are going to remember that. We had uh, issues up into Ascension and Livingston Parishes, areas that had never seen storm surge as bad as they did from what was a minimal Category 1. So every storm's different, and that's why we, you kind of have to leave it to us to hopefully tell you what the different impacts will be. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, its biggest impact was the water, the storm surge. Hurricane Gustav in 2008 was more the wind uh, in South Louisiana. So everyone's a little bit different. Great question. How many hurricanes have hit the USA uh, from Cecilia? Boy, I don't know the number. It's a lot. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, each year in the Atlantic, uh, now this uh, doesn't mean it makes landfall, but each year in the Atlantic as we track tropical storms and hurricanes, we average something like 12 tropical storms, something like six to seven hurricanes, and something on the order two to three of those become major hurricanes, category three, four, or five. But I don't have an exact number for how many have hit the USA. It's a lot. Uh, from Reese, AJ, where do hurricanes usually form? Um, so we covered a little bit of, uh, of where they form different times of the year. Uh, but the most important thing to know is they need warm water. So as we get into the summer months, that covers a good chunk of the Atlantic Ocean. One other thing I forgot to cover. Uh, you guys are doing some good questions and reminding me of points. Uh, let me get back to... Let me see if I can find something that's going to help me show you what I want to show you. Uh, so I think that was Reese that asked this question. Uh, where do hurricanes form? Well, a great point to that one is uh, a force that comes into play for hurricanes is something uh, known as the Coriolis force. This also shows up, I think, on our worksheets that I made. The Coriolis force is something that happens because the Earth spins on its axis. So here's why it's important in weather. When we have low pressure, a hurricane, winds flow in towards the center of low pressure. But as they actually move in towards the center of low pressure, they get deflected to the right a little bit. That's because of the Coriolis force. And that's essentially what makes a hurricane spin. Now, as we look at this map that I had up earlier for tracking hurricanes, uh, the Coriolis force is basically zero near the equator. So we can't really get a hurricane right on the equator or right on either side of it because the Coriolis force is so small. We have to get closer to about 10 degrees away from the equator before that Coriolis force is strong enough to produce the spin that we need for a hurricane. So that was a good question there. Hopefully that gives you a little more information. Alyssa, I thought the name Katrina had been retired. Yes, it has been retired. It has been replaced. Normal says, I want to be a meteorologist when I'm older. Well, bring it on. We, we, I'd love to have it. So I mentioned the other day, uh, in the session the other day, uh, I've loved this since at least 
can remember talking about weather to my PE teacher in second grade, so it's a lifelong love for me. So that's uh, part of why I'm doing this. I'm um, hoping, hopefully, we can inspire some of you young guys to do this too when you get older. Mackenzie wants to know if a hurricane can come at Christmas. Not around here. No. Now, keep in mind, Christmas is winter for us, but that means it's summer down in the southern hemisphere. So it depends on what part of the world you're talking about. Anytime we talk about something like this, but we, we will never see a hurricane around Christmas. Or if that happens, something's gone really wrong on the planet. Let me put it that way. Do I know the largest in size that we've had near Louisiana from Ethan and Cullen? Um, Katrina probably ranks up there in terms of one of the larger hurricanes uh, that we've had in recent memory. By contrast, I brought up Hurricane Camille earlier. Hurricane Camille hit Louisiana and Mississippi as a Category 5. Katrina, by, it hit the time, Louisiana, by the time it hit Louisiana and Mississippi, was a Category 3. Uh, but Katrina was actually much larger in size. C uh, Camille was more compact. That's why every storm is different. Um, and so an important aspect of Katrina being so big in just size, one thing we've tried to emphasize more in recent years, um, the wind speeds are real important for storm surge, but we also know a storm that's just bigger in size also produces more storm surge than one that is smaller. So it was another reason that Hurricane Katrina produced record storm surge along the Gulf Coast. We had storm surge, get this kid, storm surge that got up to almost 30 feet high in some spots when Hurricane Katrina came ashore. That's uh, nearly as tall as a three-story building if you think about that. That's a lot of water. All right, good question uh, here uh, from Reese. What other jobs can a meteorologist do besides do the weather on TV? So I mentioned a couple of things. Number one, one of the bigger employers is the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service is run by uh, the U.S. government. It's a branch of the U.S. government. They have offices all over the country. They forecast for a given region. So our local office is located in Slidell, and the area they forecast for uh, goes, extends from west of Baton Rouge, through Baton Rouge, down to Homa, down to the coast, through New Orleans, along the coast of Mississippi, and um, even up in the southwest Mississippi around Macomb. So they cover a pretty big area. Uh, they make forecasts daily. They have a lot of different things they do. Probably the most public way that you're familiar with the National Weather Service is they are the ones that issue our severe weather watches and warnings. So if a tornado watch comes out or if a severe thunderstorm warning, a tornado warning comes out, that's from the National Weather Service. Um, airlines, they need meteorologists because guess what? For airplanes, real important that they know what the weather is going to be like, right? So airlines employ a lot of uh, meteorologists. The military, all the branches of the military, they employ meteorologists. There are meteorologists that are researchers. So one of the things that we rely a lot on as meteorologists and forecasters are what we call computer models. We won't get too deep into that, but uh, weather operates on a lot of math. And our computer models, uh, really smart people have created them. They run a lot of math and they essentially give us a forecast. So there are meteorologists that are constantly developing and improving those weather models. So there's just a few different examples of uh, other jobs that meteorologists have. Um, so there, there's a lot out there. All right, Peyton Scott would like to know, what's the strongest storm you've been in, I've been in, and have I chased a storm? Uh, strongest storm I've been in. There's probably a few in the running. Um, here in Baton Rouge, Gustav was the strongest I've been here uh, in in Baton Rouge. Um, I mentioned that back in 2004, before Peyton was born, um, I was uh, 
covering Hurricane Ivan over uh, in coastal Alabama. And we went through the eye wall and the eye of that one. Uh, that was pretty intense. That one came ashore in Alabama as a Category 3. And then uh, in 2005, after Katrina, about a month after Katrina, Hurricane Rita hit southwest Louisiana, closer to Lake Charles. And I covered that one. Uh, we actually stayed at the Lobert's Casino in, uh, in Lake Charles for that one and uh, experienced some really strong winds with that one. So those, those would uh, rank up there for me. What's the difference between a hurricane and a flood? So a hurricane is a big thing that happens in the atmosphere, big cluster of clouds with rain and storms and wind and storm surge. It's got all these different parts to it. Flooding is something that comes along with hurricanes sometimes. Uh, flooding can come a couple of different ways from a hurricane. Number one, uh, the heavy rain that a hurricane might produce. And number two, the storm surge that comes with a hurricane. Uh, I was trying to see who... Uh, that was from uh, Ashanta or Ashante. Uh, that one came in. And then, of course, we can get flooding outside of hurricanes anytime we get heavy rain. And also get river flooding, as we're all too familiar with in this part of the world. There's a good one from uh, Camden in third grade. How does a hurricane end? So if you're listening today, one of the most important, well, probably the most important thing is a hurricane needs warm water. So what that means is one of the most common ways a hurricane ends is once it moves ashore onto land, it no longer has all that warm water to work with, and that can that usually means a hurricane will come to an end. Another way is sometimes when it's even when it's out over the ocean, up above and at cloud level, it might run into some dry air. Sometimes hurricanes end that way. A third way is something I kind of touched on briefly. Uh, earlier in the presentation and that is wind shear so that's when winds change in direction or wind speeds change as you move up through the up through the atmosphere in the sky wind shear can sometimes end a hurricane uh, you guys are doing awesome with the questions we'll try to take a few more and then I'm probably gonna have to wrap it up okay Can, uh, from Ali, can hurricanes cause erosion? Yes, uh, they cause coastal erosion, uh, which is uh, the result of, guess what? When you got all that wind with a hurricane moving ashore, there are big waves, right? So when the big waves start hitting the coast, that causes a lot of erosion of the coast and our beaches. That's a big concern. Uh, here in South Louisiana, and along much of the northern Gulf Coast, and not just here. Another example would be uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Uh, we have barrier islands. These little small, thin islands, when you look at them on a map, they don't look like much, but they're real important when it comes to hurricanes. They're our first line of defense. What they do is they kind of take some of the first blows from the hurricane and sometimes they can kind of soften the blow a little bit farther inland. They reduce the storm surge a little bit. They can slow it down somewhat. So, good question. All right, just trying to see. Uh, a few of you look like you're asking, what's the uh, the largest hurricane? Alexis, for instance. Um, we talked about some big ones. Uh, there, there have been some other ones. Uh, here's one thing I can tell you is the part of the ocean, the part of the globe that produces some of the biggest and baddest hurricanes is where we actually call them typhoons, and that's in the Western Pacific. Um, they're most common. That's where we have the greatest numbers of them. And that's often where the strongest ones occur. Uh, you could look it up. There's a list of them, but there are several. Uh, there's a typhoon tip 
that one comes to mind that was a bad one there have been a couple others in recent years that I'm drawing blanks on the names but you get some really bad ones over there but we've certainly had our share in around the Atlantic in recent years I uh, showed you I kind of touched on a couple of these Maria Irma uh, Florence Harvey you know there's been a lot of bad ones good question here from uh, Anthony in first grade I love this one can more than one hurricane come together to form a bigger one so typically what would happen is if we have two hurricanes that get close to each other either there's two scenarios scenario one is probably the most common one of those hurricanes is going to end up weakening uh, because if you get two of them close to each other the, the hurricane number two is going to start to get wind shear, what I talked about from number one, and that's just going to beat it up and, and knock it down, and it's going to kind of die out. Uh, the second scenario is something that was kind of discovered several decades ago. It's called the Fujiwara effect, and that's where you can get one hurricane rotating around the other. The Fujiwara effect. Google that if you want. So um, they don't they won't really come together that doesn't happen although you can kind of have one hurricane maybe sometimes absorb a little bit of the energy of one that's another that's died out but most common is you get one that kind of takes over and the other dies or you get this less less frequently less common is this Fujiwara effect Uh, Ella, AJ, can a hurricane slow down when it comes in contact with an object? Um, not really like a man-made object, if that's what you mean. Uh, but really, once a hurricane reaches land, not so much a little small island. An island might slow it down temporarily. Uh, mountains take a toll on hurricanes, so that happens a good bit uh, down in the Caribbean, especially. So places like Haiti... The Dominican Republic, uh, Eastern Cuba, they have a lot of mountains. So we watch that closely. Sometimes as they're going across areas like that, those mountains can disrupt the circulation, the spinning of a hurricane. Um, and land is the main thing that takes a toll. All right, guys, we're coming up on hour and 10 minutes. So with that, I think I'm going to have to go ahead and wrap it up. But uh, thank you to everyone that's joined me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, enjoy doing this um, like I said we're going to try to keep the momentum going uh, as it stands right now tentatively uh, we'll aim for Wednesdays and Fridays at this time one o'clock uh, the big caveat there is if on any of those days if we get into a pattern where the current weather is ongoing or we have anything severe uh, obviously that's priority number one for me so I'll have to work around that but if that's coming we'll probably have a little notice and I should be able to give you a heads up but we'll keep it going and uh, welcome your ideas now uh, I've got a couple ideas already keep in mind it takes a while to put the content together so I may not be able to do everything that uh, you guys have in mind or suggest but love the suggestions nonetheless uh the other thing is i love seeing the pictures of the kids participating uh really need to see that in action love to hear where everybody is watching from and uh hopefully you heard at the beginning uh these will be posted not only on our website uh but within our wap news app on roku fire tv so if you want to watch it on a bigger screen if you haven't figured out how to do that um, there are ways to do that live from Facebook to mirror it or to get a Facebook live app. But if you want to watch it after the fact, we've also got that option. All right, guys. Thanks again for joining me for this. Uh, we'll wrap it up and uh, we'll see you back here uh, tentatively next Wednesday at 1 o'clock for our next lesson.